Yes, can you hear me? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, very loud. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, someone's going to have to speak up if it gets too loud again. Okay, go ahead. All right. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes, it's good. Okay, this is very strange. I apologize. Um, uh, thank you all for inviting me to the, the Institute of Medicine and everybody that's there. Um, it's a real honor to be part of this group of speakers, and I very much wish that I could be there. Um, but I'm glad that I could at least present some of the work that we've been doing in our lab. This is going to be a very different talk from the last talk. Um, I'm not even sure how we ended up in the neurobiology section. But um, I'm going to talk today about some of our work on the developmental and psychopharmacological effects of caffeine. Um, as you've been hearing about today, and will continue to hear about today and tomorrow, there are many physiological effects of caffeine. Um, there, there's acute cardiovascular effects. Caffeine also has ergogenic properties. Uh, and then there's chronic effects of caffeine, including caffeine tolerance and withdrawal. There's also psychopharmacological effects of caffeine that have been well described, including increased energy, increased alertness, improved mood, and enhanced cognitive performance. I'd like to point out, though, that the majority of these studies, a the vast majority of these studies, have been conducted in adults. And my interest in this area of research is to understand what the effects of caffeine are in children and adolescents. Uh, so that's the work that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, these data have been adapted from uh, data published by the Center for Science and the Public Interest. But as you can see, um, the dosage of caffeine varies very widely across sources. This red line here is the FDA limits for caffeine content in cola. And you can see that there are several um, coffees that you can purchase as well as energy drinks that exceed uh, these FDA limits. And this is uh, milligrams of caffeine per serving, but the same trend exists when you look at the milligrams of caffeine per ounce. Uh, the other thing that is interesting to me is how caffeine use patterns vary across the lifespan. So you can see um, average daily caffeine consumption really increases uh, and peaks when you get to be about my age and then maybe tapers off a little bit. And the thing that is really important for my research is that the dietary sources of caffeine really vary. So when you look at uh, children under the age of 18, the primary source of caffeine is soda. Um, and very little coffee consumption. Um, and as you get over the age of 18, there's a big shift where um, coffee becomes the primary source of caffeine and soda um, becomes a secondary source of caffeine. These data were adapted from uh, a paper by Ferry et al. Uh, in 2005, but I have to point out that the data for the study were taken, uh, were collected between 1994 and 1998. So these data don't really include energy drinks at all, and I think that the data will show a slightly different pattern if we were to include energy drinks. So from the perspective of caffeine use, I think that there are some potentially vulnerable populations. Um, the first one is pregnant women. Um, there's some evidence that excessive caffeine use may increase the risk of miscarriage, and there's very little known about the effects of caffeine use during pregnancy on offspring later on in life. Um, but today I'm going to focus on um, talking about children and adolescents. Um, children are a vulnerable population because um, if you look at the amount of caffeine per kilogram of body weight, they may have elevated exposure, in particular given the caffeine content in energy drinks. Um, and caffeine may also present a gateway to using other substances, and I'll touch on that a little bit. Um, adolescents are another vulnerable population. There's escalating caffeine use at this age much higher use of energy drinks, and then um, combinations of energy drinks and alcohol, which I'm not going to talk about today. But some of the main differences between children and adolescents and adults, there's three main differences that have driven my research. One is the sources of caffeine are different. So again, I mentioned soda versus coffee, but coffee contains caffeine naturally. And the, the caffeine content in coffee can vary based on how it's brewed and where you buy it. Um, but it's not something that has been added. Uh, caffeine is added to soda. Um, and, and it's added to energy drinks. It's not a natural source of caffeine. It, it's a vehicle for caffeine um, for children. So I think that that's important. The other difference is that the, the experience, the lifetime experience with caffeine is very different in children than in adults. Um, most adults consume caffeine. They've had a history of caffeine use, which affords them um, 
some tolerance to the effects of caffeine, whereas the experience of children, especially young children, um, they're fairly naive. They tend to consume caffeine at relatively low doses and less frequently or with less regularity than adults do. And so this may make them particularly vulnerable to the effects of, um, of a large amount of caffeine all at once. Um, and then the other reason why I believe that children and adolescents are a vulnerable population and are important to study is because their brains are still developing. There's a, a good amount of brain development that's still going on, especially when we're talking about um, the frontal lobe and frontal cortex. And there's very little known about the impact of high levels of caffeine on the brain during this, this really critical period for brain development. So today I'm going to briefly review the work that my lab has done examining the effects of caffeine in children and adolescents. And I have to say that um, when I put all this research together, it often feels like a very broad overview at a, and a lot of description of the effects of caffeine. Um, and this was almost necessary because when we first began this work um, about seven years ago, there was so little work that had been done in children and adolescents that I felt like we were almost starting from scratch. Um, so I'm going to touch on several of our studies. I'm definitely not going to tell you everything that we've um, talked about. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about our future directions and where I think some of the gaps in the literature are. So four of the major areas that we've studied um, are looking at the reinforcing properties of caffeine, the cardiovascular responses to caffeine, subjective effects of caffeine, and then um, I'm going to briefly show some new data on the cognitive effects of caffeine. Um, but I'm going to start by talking about the reinforcing properties. Um, this was one of the first studies that we did, and what drove this research is the fact, again, that the caffeine is added to soda. And so I was very interested in why soda manufacturers would add caffeine to soda. And um, the claim from beverage manufacturers is that caffeine is added uh, to enhance the flavor, but caffeine is extremely bitter, and um, work by Griffiths and others have shown that at the levels contained within soda, um, very few people can taste the difference between caffeinated and non-caffeinated soda. So we approach this work with the hypothesis that caffeine is added to increase the reinforcing properties of soda, as well as to increase liking of soda, which will therefore increase consumption. So as a proof of concept, we designed a study to, to test whether or not caffeinated soda is more, becomes reinforcing over time. Um, so this is our experimental design. I'm going to walk you through it. Um, we had we stratified our, our subjects by caffeine use, so um, less than 25 milligrams a day to greater than 75 milligrams per day. And these were 12 to 17-year-olds. And we brought them into the lab, and we tested the reinforcing value of caffeinated and non-caffeinated beverages. And um, I'm not going to show how we do that, but basically we, we set up an operant response condition where the participants press a mouse button, and after so many mouse button presses, they're reinforced with a portion of soda. And we had them taste a caffeinated version of a soda and the non-caffeinated version of the soda. And they worked for those sodas on two different computers. So we could establish the baseline, how hard they were willing to work for each, the placebo soda and the caffeinated soda. Then we sent them home uh, with four two-liter bottles of soda containing placebo or caffeine. The sodas were all non-caffeinated, and we either added caffeine back or um, placebo and they were, the labels were removed, so the participant didn't know um, what they had, and they were labeled with an A or a B. They consumed 32 ounces of soda per day. Um, each person consumed the same exact amount of soda, um, and then they came back after one week, returned their empty bottles, and we asked them, how much did you like the soda the previous week? What was your mood in general the previous week? And then we gave them another set of soda with the opposite conditions, and then after the two weeks, they returned to the lab where we tested the reinforcing value of the caffeinated and the non-caffeinated soda again. Um, the participants were unaware that caffeine was being manipulated. Um, so they just knew that they had soda A one week, soda B another week. And when they returned to the lab, they, um, they again played the game. They worked for soda. Um, this is, let me walk you through these graphs. Um, on the y-axis is the number of button presses, so the number of times they pushed the mouse button. And on the x-axis is the schedule of reinforcement. So at first, they had to click the mouse button four times um, to get a point towards soda. And then we doubled it, 8, 16, 32, and so on and so forth. So when we do these studies, we typically see a curve that increases and then decreases when we look at the average. And what you see on the panel on the left is the responses for soda at baseline in males shown with the black circles and females shown with the white circles. 
there was no difference in the responding for caffeinated soda at baseline between males and females. But after the exposure period, what we saw is a significant shift, significant increase in the reinforcing value in males, and a slight decrease in the reinforcing value in females. So after they had an experience with the caffeinated soda, it became more reinforcing in the males, but less reinforcing in the females. And I don't have the data shown here, but um, there was no change in the reinforcing value of the placebo beverage. So this was specific to the beverage that contained caffeine. So this study shows that caffeine added to soda can increase the reinforcing value of soda. Uh, the next test we wanted to do was to see whether it could increase the, the subjective liking of soda. So again, we, we stratified users by caffeine use. And I should say, in the previous study, there was no difference as a function of caffeine use. Um, so we had participants come in, and they tasted seven novel sodas and, um, on the first visit. And then we picked the beverage that they ranked number four. And then for four visits after that, they returned to the lab, and they had that beverage paired with either placebo or caffeine. And then on a sixth visit, they re-rated the liking of, of the beverage as well as the ranking of the beverage. Um, and this is based on work by Marty Yeomans, who's done this a lot in adults, and we wanted to see whether or not the same thing would hold up in children. And what we found here, we, we used two different doses of caffeine. We had a one milligram per kilogram and two milligram per kilogram group. You can see with the black circles here that the group that had placebo did not change their liking of the soda, of the soda over time. The group that had the one milligram per kilogram dose um, did have an increase on the last visit, um, but before that the pattern stayed the same as the placebo. But the group that had the novel soda paired with the two milligram per kilogram dose showed a steady increase um, over time in their liking of the soda. So again, and um, these are data from a study that we did in adults using yogurt but we showed the same thing. This is novel flavored yogurt. The black circle is um, paired with placebo, and the white is when the yogurt was paired with um, caffeine. So these studies have shown that in children, when you pair caffeine with um, soda, it can increase the self-reported liking of that soda, and it can increase the reinforcing value of that soda. Um, and this does not happen when the beverages are paired with placebo. So now I'm going to touch on some of our cardiovascular work in children. And um, I don't have the study design here. These were all double-blind placebo-controlled dose response studies where each child had um, one of four doses on four different visits. And we measured heart rate, um, diastolic, and systolic blood pressure every 10 minutes for an hour. And what we showed is in both males and females, we showed a dose-dependent decrease in heart rate and increase in blood pressure as would be expected. Um, but when we look, um, when we compare gender, this again is in 12 to 17 year olds. Um, what we found is that the caffeine really didn't, um, when we compared, sorry, across low and high users, there was really no difference in females. There's no evidence of, of tolerance to the, the cardiovascular effects of caffeine in females. But in males, what we found is actually that the high users had a stronger cardiovascular response to caffeine than to the low users. And this suggests that there might be some sort of sensitization to caffeine, and that's something that we're exploring further. Um, but this, combined with our previous work on reinforcing value, suggests that there might be some gender differences in the response to caffeine. So in a subsequent set of studies, we have started to look at the developmental aspects of this sex difference. So we've looked in prepubertal and postpubertal children and we've repeated the same study where we're looking at cardiovascular response to caffeine. Um, and what we see here is that um, this is looking at the change in heart rate um, from the placebo, and these are all two milligram per kilogram, um, and then the change in systolic blood pressure from the placebo. And you can see that um, that sex difference is maintained um, in, in postpubertal children where the females are having a dampened response to the caffeine compared to the males but we don't see that same sex difference in the prepubertal children. So our new data are suggesting that the sex difference in the response to caffeine is something that emerges after puberty. Um, we've also seen a sex difference in the subjective effects of caffeine. So in that first study I, um, I mentioned where, or sorry, the study where we did the dose response, we also had a caffeine use questionnaire that was developed by Kathleen Miller, and we asked these kids their reasons for using caffeine. And when we looked, we found that the males were much more likely to report using caffeine to get energy, using caffeine to get a rush, and using caffeine to enhance 
um, performance, either academic or athletic performance. There was no difference in using caffeine to concentrate or using caffeine because friends used caffeine. So in this case, males are endorsing more subjective effects or stronger subjective effects of caffeine than our females. And again, this was in 12 to 17 year olds. Um, and in, an, in a follow-up study to that, we looked directly at the subjective effects, and this was all in post-puberal children. And we, um, we used a drug effects questionnaire that we gave them every 10 minutes after um, either placebo or two milligrams per kilogram of caffeine. And this is obtained from placebo. And what you can see is that the males report feeling the effects of caffeine more, liking it more, feeling high, and then um, specifically or particularly wanting more of the caffeine. Um, whereas the females actually showed a negative response to the caffeine. So compared with the placebo, they, they said they felt it less, they liked it less, they felt less high, and they definitely wanted the, um, the caffeinated beverage less than they wanted the placebo beverage. So again, these studies support our work in general that's suggesting that there's a, a sex difference in response to caffeine. The last bit of data I'm going to present are some of our new data that hasn't been published yet um, showing cognitive effects of caffeine. Um, and this study was a between subject design where um, participants had either zero, one milligram per kilogram, or two milligram per kilogram doses. And this is in pre and post pubertal children. Um, but I'm showing the combined data because um, these were the, oh, sorry, I have the design here. Um, I'm going to show the combined data because the, there were main effects of caffeine. Um, so we, we had participants come in and we tested their. Um, cognitive response at baseline, we used um, a cognitive battery that we could use in 8- and 9-year-olds as well as in 15- uh, and 16-year-olds. So we looked at simple reaction time, complex reaction time, memory search, stroop, and go-no-go. No go. I'm just going to show the stroop effect data today. Um, so participants had either placebo, 1 milligram per kilogram, or 2 milligrams per kilogram of caffeine. Um, so we tested their cognitive functioning at baseline, and then again after an hour. And these data are all the change from baseline responding. And what you can see is that compared to the placebo, um, both a one milligram per kilogram and two milligram per kilogram dose of caffeine improved the number correct on the Stroop task, the reaction time on the Stroop task, the number correct per minute or the throughput on the Stroop task, and it reduced the standard deviation um, on the Stroop task. And so what we're seeing is that in general, there's a main effect of caffeine on cognitive functioning in children. And we have seen a few subtle effects of gender um, and of pubertal phase, but I, I didn't have time to show those data today. Um, so just to summarize what we've shown is that caffeine definitely has effects in children um, that are consistent with some of the findings in adults. The, the biggest difference that we found is that there don't seem to be a lot of differences in high caffeine users versus low caffeine users. We've actually never found any differences really between the high users and low users. And I think that this is because even in what we consider high users in children, they're still using caffeine um, relatively infrequently and at relatively smaller doses compared to adults. So it's possible that children haven't developed tolerance to the effects of caffeine quite yet. So um, one of the future directions that my lab is interested in is understanding the relationship between early caffeine use and later drug use. Um, there are some good cross-sectional data in humans. Um, and there's some good um, experimental data in animals. Um, so caffeine enhances the reinforcing value of nicotine in humans and cocaine in rats. So there's definitely some, um, some cross-sensitization between caffeine and drugs. Um, caffeine also induces dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. Um, and caffeine conditions, conditions flavor preferences in adults and in children. And so there's definitely enough um, enough of a suggestion that there could be a relationship between caffeine use and drug use. And so this is one of the things that we're really going after, and we'd like to, to study this in a, in a prospective design where we, we take children and we look at early caffeine use, and then we follow them over time and see what that early caffeine use predicts. Um, I'd also just like to briefly touch on some things that I feel are gaps in the literature. When I was putting together this talk and other talks, I find it very difficult to find a, a really current survey of caffeine use in adults and children in the U.S. A lot of the data are old and don't really capture um, the potential shifts in usage that have happened since energy drinks have really flooded the market. Um, again, I also think we need prospective studies examining factors that relate to high-level caffeine use 
um, and potential risks of high-level caffeine use, um, in particular in children and adolescents. Um, studies that examine prospective relationships <coughs> between early caffeine use and later substance use. Um, and again, studies on long-term effects of caffeine use, um, particularly studies beginning in childhood and progressing into adulthood. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank um, my lab. Um, the, the ones highlighted in red are the ones that have done um, a, a ton of the work on these studies. And I'd like to thank um, funding both, uh, all of these studies were funded by NIDA. Um, and my co-investigators on this work, John Hughes, Marty Yeomans, and um, Harriet DeWitt. Thank you.